Welcome. Thanks very much for joining us. Um, this session as part of Transport and Logistics um, Online 2021 is focused on the future of logistics real estate. We've got a super panel here um, and we're going to be looking at some of, I suppose, the kind of key topics, I guess, um, that, that are driving this both in terms of the occupiers, the investors, and also some of the key trends for consumers, um, just in terms of, of what that means in terms of the real estate side. Um, Super panel here. We've got Sally Brewer, who's partner of logistics and industrial at Cushman and Wakefield. We've got Ben Bannatyne, president of Europe for, for Prologis. We've got Sally. Uh, we've got Robert Dobritsky, um, who's CEO of Europe for Panatoni. Um, Raymond Petsman, who's obviously vice president um, for Zalando. Um, Otis Spencer, CIO of P3 Logistic Partners. And last but not least, Ian Warboys, who's MD and uh, head of Europe for Trammell Crow Company. Um, so a really great mix of, uh, of experts on the market. We're going to start just with a presentation from Sally, um, just to just to pick up some of the the kind of key trends that we should be thinking about when we're looking at uh, particularly at the real estate side. Um, so, Sally, let me let me hand over to you. Thanks, Richard. And uh, yeah, a few minutes to talk about the future of logistics real estate, no less. Um, I thought that the best way to think about the future of logistics real estate is to think about what's influencing and driving the future of logistics and consider how real estate's responding to and, and shaping our industry and how it will remain relevant to operators in the way they'll use logistics facilities and to address the ways in which logistics property fits into the bigger picture of economies, communities and the environment. So in order to do that, I'm just going to address sort of five key drivers in logistics, uh, looking at supply chain evolution, last link logistics, people, technology and sustainability. So starting with supply chain evolution and particularly how consumers, oh, sorry, how consumers and businesses have been responding to disruption. Indeed, the last year or so has accelerated or highlighted some of the trends and and shown new ones emerging in the way in which goods flow from production to consumption, how we make, move and consume goods. So let's think about these three factors in particular. So thinking about the online retail revolution, certainly not a new trend, but one that's been seeing some of the biggest shifts in our industry and beyond in the past decade and one that will continue to shape our sector for some time to come. Last year, no great surprise, we saw uh, an acceleration of the growth, well, certainly a surprise, but no great surprise to all of us that we saw such a huge growth in online retail, particularly as a result of the COVID lockdowns. And indeed, we saw the same growth online in Europe uh, in online sales volume in one year as we'd seen in the previous five years combined. Um, so now retailers, new and emerging, have an opportunity to plan how to secure and deepen relationships with customers, particularly newly converted ones, but also how to do it in a cost and operationally efficient and margin accretive way. This will no doubt mean more demand for logistics space, but different logistics networks need different types of property in different locations. It's not a one size fits all answer. And I'm sure Raymond will have plenty to say about that. Secondly, food production and distribution. And the last year has certainly shown us the pressures and the ways in which places from which we source food as a result of seeing the effects of disruption to food supply chains firsthand, which is driving a, a greater focus perhaps on localization of food sourcing and also geopolitical, geopolitical factors such as changing trade relationships means that the flow of food from production locations is changing to, for some markets. And finally, manufacturing and production, uh, which is typically a much longer term proposition in terms of commitments, not just to property and locations, but also to plant and technology. But in response to recent disruptions, it does mean that businesses are considering how they hold stock and whether with changing trade relationships is just in time logistics as manageable, or if businesses will need to consider holding greater inventory levels for longer to maintain supply without interruption all the way through to where they have their manufacturing facilities, particularly the issue of onshoring or nearshoring. And we're starting to see some of our manufacturing clients inquiring about or even doing deals for facilities closer to the markets they serve. So how will all, the, all of this affect real estate? Well, this is to discuss, but certainly it's about location, but also about the type of space for the right operational needs for users to operate effectively and efficiently. So the second big driver, 
um, it relates to what and where customers want goods to be delivered and particularly one of the biggest challenges facing logistics users and the property industry is the challenge of urban and last link logistics and despite all the things that have happened in the past year expectations are that people will continue to live more and more in cities indeed by 2030 over three quarters of the people of Europe are expected to be living in urban areas and there are expected to be 74 cities of a million people or more across Europe alone. And with increasing challenges moving goods around cities, from the age-old problem of traffic congestion to new and emerging restrictions on the types and sizes of vehicles moving around cities, it's no wonder that in terms of total cost, last mile is overwhelmingly the largest element. So part of this challenge is where fulfillment is achieved, but also the types of space that can be delivered to create effective urban distribution and delivery and fulfillment for businesses. And there are challenges around supply of sites and appropriate facilities, but also around design and intensification or co-location of uses for logistics operations. Whatever it is or wherever it is, it has to be margin accretive for operators because the cost of being in the wrong space or the wrong location can be far more costly um, for businesses overall uh, operations. When it comes to cost, um, it's also a significant factor. It's significant that labour is at the very top of the tree when it comes to locational choices for operators. Um, logistics is still a human capital intensive business. Lots of people are typically required to make the business that operate within warehouses work. However, there are long standing and significant challenges around the recruitment of appropriate staff, particularly in skilled jobs, but also in jobs that there are difficult recruiting new people to the industry and this has a knock-on effect on cost so issues of staff retention and performance are really important to businesses occupying logistics facilities and employers are increasingly look, looking at ways to attract and retain staff and improve productivity and this has an impact on the type of space they require and how they use it including what goes on inside buildings what type of space we build and deliver for the market such as the inclusion of wellness and welfare space for workers and improved improving quality of facilities overall also what's offered on parks as a whole what ancillary services are being provided on site and what outside welfare space is provided for staff such as running tracks or outside leisure space also the attractiveness and the connectivity of the places that they work in people want to work in places that are nice places to work in and that are easy for them to access so their connectivity to their broader communities so placemaking has longer term benefits both for occupiers but also for investors and developers of space in terms of retention of tenants and of value and it's about making sure that, that that occupiers have the tools in place for them to be able to operate effectively and efficiently this brings us on to another key factor in what it means to operate space and that is particularly sitting alongside the challenge of labor which is the implementation or oh, the implementation of technology um, and again not necessarily a new trend but we perhaps stand at the brink of some uh, a broader and wider adoption of technology um, that particularly relate to three key areas either in or near warehouses um, or throughout the delivery side, such as AVs, uh, vehicles, or delivery, you know, last link delivery, such as robots. And also, and far less easily demonstrable in an image, is the collection, synthesis, and use of data um, from within warehouses, but also throughout the supply chain and delivery process. What's important to remember is that the majority of technology that's deployed in warehouses is used to complement and enhance human skills, efficiency, and productivity, making safe workplaces safer and more accurate. And one of the reasons that, or some of the reasons that technology might be now about to be more widely adopted is because it's becoming cheaper. Um, it's also becoming more flexible. It can be implemented across a greater variety of operations for a broader, uh, broader type, broader types of users. And it's with this greater implementation of technology that is not only shaping how buildings look and what they what it sits within them and how they're used how the
buildings and spaces are used, but also the demand that that puts on for energy usage, um, and particularly the pressure on logistics real estate providers to be able to deliver what users need, to be able to run their facilities, both now and in the future. And that links neatly to the last big mega trend, which is, of course, sustainability, which arguably is perhaps evolving the most dramatically and will potentially have the greatest impact on our industry and wider um, now and into the future. Um, why is it so important now? Well, people and businesses have become even more focused on sustainability factors because they affect so many parts of their operations and crucially are so keenly now so keenly integrated into businesses and people's identities. They're both their brand identities and their personal choices. Sustainability makes a difference about how people choose to work and the companies they choose to work for. So potentially the impact on staffing. It, in, it inflects how businesses can procure and which suppliers they'll deal with, not just in terms of the types of products that people will buy to stock or to, to manufacture um, or to buy from, but also the types of property companies and the type of property they will acquire and operate. And also it's increasingly and assuredly part of how investors are focusing on how they put their capital to work. So what does this mean for logistics property? Well, finally, um, and this is my, my last slide, um, much of the focus of sustainability features of buildings in the past decade have been focused on operating carbon and how we reduce the amount of carbon emissions through the usage of the buildings. And that's been um, particularly focused on operating, uh, the, the reducing the operating carbon and also reducing the operating cost of a building. But the biggest shift that will affect our industry more and more is the impact of embodied carbon and how our industry has embraced the challenge to deal with the impact of construction, maintaining and even end of life challenges of logistics buildings. Just um, one final point about sustainability, which is to think about it within the bigger picture of how our, our sector of logistics logistics property sits within um, uh, the overall in sustainable sustainability impacts of, of our sector of logistics. And this last slide, this last chart shows the components of global greenhouse gas emissions estimated by the World Economic Forum for each element of the global freight industry. And we can see that logistics buildings account for around 17% of global greenhouse gas emissions. And we certainly all have an opportunity to play a part in being able to reduce the impact that logistics buildings have. However, as you can see, 83% is part of, it, 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 of the global greenhouse gas emissions are actually from the emissions through the movement of goods by different modes of transport, notably from road freight. So what this means is that the greatest gains that can be made will be in the mitigation or the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions through the transport side of the logistics industry. So as an industry, the logistics sector, the logistics property sector has an opportunity to be able to be ready to embrace some of those changes. So part of that might mean ensuring that we have capability for electric vehicle adoption in a broader sense. Will we have the charging locations on site? Will there be parking areas for vehicles to be able to charge? And what will the energy generation be required to be able to charge those electric vehicles, for example? So lots of big questions to be asked of logistics property at the moment and in the future in terms of what, where, how and how much space is needed and also maintaining value for users and owners now and into the future. What's clear is that the future is bright and there are lots of exciting thing ha things happening and lots of exciting things happening in the response to the challenges but also recognising opportunities in logistics real estate. So I shall stop there and we shall continue on with our panel. For those who didn't know me, my name is Richard Betts. I'm the publisher at uh, Real Asset Media. Do feel free to contact us either using this system or using the website. I won't say any more about us because we've got too many things to talk about today. Um, so let's start. Um, let's start just with some introductions. Really great presentation there, Sally, and introduces a lot of things for us to discuss. Um, let's start with you, Otis. Just just kind of a minute on on yourself and, and the company, just so that everybody knows which side of the table you're on. 
Hi, my name is Otis Spencer. I'm a Chief Investment Officer for P3 Logistic Parts. P3 is a long-term, it's privately held, long-term investor, manager, and developer of uh, European logistic assets. Uh, we currently manage about 6.7 million square meters, and we have a development pipeline or land bank that would support 1.7 million additional developments across Europe. Uh, we are, as I mentioned, active all across Europe, but our particular focus right now is on Western Europe, where we're looking to acquire, to build out our land bank, as well as on the acquisition front to get further scale across Europe. Super. Thanks very much. Um, ben, just, just quickly on yourself and Prologis. Yeah, uh, good afternoon. So my name is Ben Bannatine. I am the president for Prologis in Europe. Uh, Prologis is a global global company. Uh, our European operation, um, we're in 12 countries. Uh, we have just over 20 billion euros of real estate under management. Uh, we develop, we acquire, uh, we own and we manage. Um, so we're long-term holders of, of real estate. I really have moved our focus very much from the production end to the consumption end. Uh, so looking at the big population centres um, and to continue to invest in those markets across Europe. Super, thanks very much. Um, Raymond, let's let's come to you, just, just on yourself and Zolando. Hello, also good afternoon from my side. So my name is Raymond Petzman. I'm 23 years now in the e-commerce business from A to Z, uh, now with Zalando for three and a half years. Uh, and uh, yeah, we are 10 billion um, euro business in Europe, the number one fashion platform in Europe with yeah, huge growth ambitions. So we just brought out that we're actually targeting 30 billion in 2025. So there's a lot to do uh, to maintain this uh, growth. Um, momentum. Yeah, looking forward to the discussion. And thanks, Sally. There's actually not much for us to discuss because you mentioned everything. So. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks very much. Robert, over to you. Yeah, so uh, Robert Dobrzycki, I am CEO of Panaponi Europe. Uh, Panaponi is a privately owned uh, US based development company active in Europe since 2005. We are probably one of the most active players in Europe in terms of uh, new starts and development. Uh, we are covering most of the countries in Europe and obviously we, we try to follow the customers and, uh, and respond to their needs wherever they, they need us and uh, wherever there is a need for our service. Super, thanks very much. I Ian. Hi, uh, Ian Warboy is Managing Director of Tremel Crow. Um, many people don't know <coughs> who Tremel Crow are, but in the United States, uh, Tremel Crow Company is the largest developer in the United States of America. Uh, as of uh, January this year, they had uh, over 14.9 billion of value actually under construction. Um, of which six billion was uh, in logistics. So uh, a very big player in the States. And uh, we only started here in uh, March, but um, we've already uh, got offices now in the UK, France, Germany, Spain, soon to open in the Czech Republic. Uh, with Italy and the Netherlands starting next year. <clears throat> we're a, a trader developer um, and uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to making an impact in Europe. Great, look forward to it Ian, thanks very much. Um, and uh, last, you, you, you didn't introduce yourself Sally, so let's briefly do that as well here. <laughs> I'm sorry, I launched straight in, I was too eager. Um, I'm Sally Brewer, I'm a partner in the uh, EMEA research and insight team at uh, um, Cushman and Wakefield and uh, um, I'm a I hate to say how many years experienced in uh, as a logistics and industrial specialist, particularly. Um, and uh, um, I, I think I made a, a really good choice back in you know the early 2000s when I decided to specialise in sheds. Uh, it's all <laughs> it's all come round, hasn't it? But yeah, so I specialise in looking at some of the um, supply demand uh, dynamics of our sector um, and uh, the big drivers. Um, hence the sort of start starting point of our conversation, thinking about what's shaping the future, but what it means to logistics property. Great, super, thanks. Um, let's let's start with you, um, Ben. And, and of course, if, if you've got any questions on the right hand side, um, you'll see the chat. So do put those questions in. I'm monitoring that. Um, so if you've got any questions, then I will I'll I'll pick those up and make sure that, that we ask those. Um, but Ben, just just coming to you, um, a lot of a lot of important trends there highlighted by Sally. Um, I guess 
What, which, which do you see as the most important in terms of influencing the future of the logistics real estate side? Um, I mean, both from a global and European perspective, I think the the number one is still the transformation of the whole retail landscape. Um, so that has just been fueling growth, I mean, right across the US and, and obviously more recently across Europe. Um, the COVID pandemic accelerated that change. Uh, and as Sally said, I think, you know, in the last year we saw adoption of uh, e-commerce increase significantly um you know up to um the combined five years previous so whilst that may slow down it's no doubt that is going to continue um at a pace and that's really fueling um growth you know right across europe um also potentially some um sort of near shoring um we haven't seen a huge amount of that yet but i think we can expect more of that in central europe uh, with more of a focus on some of the production uh, as i said earlier our focus really has swung to the consumer um, that's really where we see the highest growth and highest barriers to entry you know to be honest in terms of um, being closer to the big population centers so retail definitely uh, a big driver uh, but our traditional customer base is also expanding um, and, and again right across Europe. Um, so I think for the foreseeable future, certainly looking out two or three more years, um, there's a lot going on in this sector. Um, not just e-commerce, traditional players, um, data centres, um, a lot to keep us all busy. Yeah, it's really interesting. And that the data centers thing, I think, is a really interesting element as well. Um, uh, Otis, just coming to you, in terms of that near shoring side, um, I suppose, how are you seeing that at, at the moment? Do you see that as something that's going to increase the, the requirement for space going forward in terms of the real estate needed? I think definitely the nearshoring as a trend will have an impact on our business as we see some of, some of our customers looking to plan because what happened last year was the complete shutdown of some of the uh, supply chains that now people are looking at more at resilient supply chains. And so that is then leading to them taking more space and really planning ahead so they can be prepared in the event there's another shock to, to the supply chain. As uh, Ben mentioned, we definitely think Central Europe will be a beneficiary of that, but we're also seeing a lot of activity in Western Europe, in places such as the Netherlands and Germany, France and Spain, uh, a lot of activity where these groups are looking, uh, our customers are looking for more space to plan for the future. Um, and Raymond, in terms of the supply chain, I mean, Sully mentioned there in, in the presentation some of the challenges that were created um, by the pandemic, especially in the response to that. Um, are you seeing changes in terms of the supply chain, evolution of the supply chain? Um, and I suppose, if so, what does that mean for some of the real estate decisions that, that you're making? To be perfectly honest, I do not see the, the huge shift. Of course, near shoring, shoring will play a bigger role, but as always, you know, everyone is talking about no, now about more resilient supply chains. Uh, but you know, as soon as this is over, then the costs will get more in the focus again. And so I assume the impact will not be so big. There may be a, a general trend, and that's something that is not very often discussed. Uh, that you have, you know, being China now getting bigger and bigger, you know, also from an economic perspective, they're maybe not cheap enough anymore, or Cambodia and Vietnam uh, for all the fashion, for example. So maybe there's the next market coming, going to, uh, to Africa anyway. So there could be a big shift, but that's more the long term in the supply chain. And I think, to be honest, it's also interesting that the, pan uh, the, the Suez Canal uh, thing had actually a bigger effect than the pandemic right now. So you see more problems because in, in the, uh, during the pandemic, it was a supply and demand crisis. So that was the, the good thing that the demand was at least for one month or the one and a half months was also low except for food. Uh, but long story short, I, I, I see some changes with nearshoring also driven by sustainability, but not a general trend that is, you know, that everyone has to rethink the, the real estate strategy now. Mm. But, okay. Richard, I, th I think the resiliency thing, though, is a big point. Um, clearly, it's much more expensive to have goods out of stock than to pay for a bit more inventory. So uh, we're, we're reckoning anything between a 5 to 10% increase in the need for grade A logistics space just to cover the resiliency factor. 
Uh, so if you put that across the stock of Europe, it's a significant growth for the you know for the foreseeable future. No, that's interesting. And and Robert, in terms of th that growth, part of it driven obviously by e-commerce as well that that Ben mentioned and and Sally as well. Um, what sort of space are people looking for there? Is that big box? Is it? I mean, Ben mentioned as well, getting closer to the customer. Um, how close do they need to get? I mean, what do we need in terms of real estate? I, think, I guess that's a good question for anyone, but, <laughs> but from what we see, I mean, there's a need for all type of facilities from a kind of a very large fulfillment centers, from a single story, multi-story, uh, cross docks, mother of, mother of kind of, uh, of other facilities, but also less mile. I mean, less mile right now is in huge demand, especially in Western Europe. Uh, where big, big e-commerce uh, customers are very active and they try to penetrate this market, so, so we see a lot of demand. And this portion of the business is usually at the most complicated from the delivery standpoint. Uh, you need a lot of facilities close to the customer base, uh, in many cases infield, brownfield, uh, a bit complicated to deliver, uh, and usually in this location, you compete with other users too, like residential or offices. So this is not the easiest, but also it's kind of a repeatable business. So we like that portion of, of, of volume. But I mean, demand is coming from all types of facilities. And uh, in many cases, also what we see is uh, the recent flow of, of demand is coming from 3PLs, 3PLs which are being hired by large e-commerce companies to deliver fast and to secure uh, like, uh, real estate fast and probably um, take care of the labor side. So this this trend is clearly visible and we signed recently several transactions. And again, here the challenge is you have absolutely no time. So that's, which is which is okay. I mean, this is, this is what we try to kind of uh, ask our clients, meaning kind of a complete flexibility, but it is, it is challenging to serve large customers in scale uh, where everything is under pressure and uh, you're working under the COVID regimes. And, but this is, this is what kind of drives people and it's exciting on one hand. So, but on the other hand, it's very challenging. Uh, and do, does that match your experience, Raymond, as well, in terms of what you're looking for, that desire for to be much, much closer to the customer. And I suppose is, is the sort of timeline that you're looking at much more immediate, I guess, than, than a developer would need to be able to develop the types of space that you need? That's certainly a challenge, I can tell you, as Robert said already, time is it's of, uh, it's a matter here, so you, you have to fix it, and that's exactly what you're looking, you try to get the, optimize the supply chain, and it's, not everything is driven by, uh, as I said before, by reshoring or something, it's also by higher demand, of course, if there's higher demand and also inbound, you have to manage it somehow with inbound distribution center and um, everything what you need for this, but the biggest challenge is certainly that the growth, and I think everyone uh, who knows me knows that I always have done a, a presentation about exponential growth. Uh, I think that's something I do not have to explain anymore because everyone understood it now with the pandemic. Uh, but that's what it is. You know, if you grow 30 percent, it means kind kind of doubling every three years, and that's what we are seeing currently in this in this whole logistic industry. And that means normally you have lead times of three or four years for a building in with the constraint uh, land availability, and now you still have to do it actually in 18 months or two years. So that's uh, certainly a conflict uh, where the developers have to uh, to deal with and of course also we have to deal with. Mm -hmm. Um, and Ian, you mentioned there about, um, you know, Trammell Crow being very large in the States, coming over here, looking at, at the opportunities. I mean, partly when we're looking at the sort of future of the logistic real estate side and picking up on the points from Sally there about some of the, the key trends, because we're, we're moving quite fast at the moment in terms of some of these changes, how easy is it then to look at assets that may well still be there and relevant in 10, 20, 30 years, potentially, um, because they obviously need to be resilient both from an investment point of view, but also meeting the needs of, of, of future occupiers, I suppose? Yeah, and I think that's that's one of the very big challenges at the moment is for us developers is working out firstly what, what is the future 
and uh, Raymond uh, uh, said things are moving so quickly it's very hard to, to, to plan ahead and that means with, with ESG it's looking at, at what is, uh, as Sally said earlier what, how much of the uh, warehouse has got, to be, uh, has got to be carbon neutral and how is the power of the future warehouse going to be looked at are we, are we all going to be putting in Tesla batteries or hydrogen batteries into our warehouses as standard um, and if we do will the investors or all the occupiers pay for that I mean historically occupiers always talked about green buildings but if the rent goes up by 10%, all of a sudden it's it's not as important. Likewise, um, at the moment, valuation doesn't take into account how green a building is. So I think that, that's one point. Secondly is uh, on technology. If everyone's going to drive to work in cars that need to be powered and lorries need to be electric, um, because that's what maybe planners have put um, constraints on planning or uh, planning permission by insisting that everything in the future is going to be electric then we as developers have to design that into the warehouse we're doing so those challenges are, are huge for us um, certainly from Trammell Crow's point of view they've got big teams in the, in the states and now we're part of those teams looking at all these different elements and working with end users um, to, to see what is required yeah, and that's interesting. You mentioned the, um, the the challenges created by changes in regulation in cities, um, and I know we've got here in London. I'm, I'm in London at the moment, and we've got ULES coming in in terms of which is the ultra low emission zone for London. I, I think also Ben, there's something similar in uh, in Amsterdam at the moment and in the Dutch market. Um, yes. so, so Ben, you're already looking at these, I suppose. H how are you? tackling that at the moment and I suppose what's your how do you see this developing I guess so I mean power clearly is one of the big issues and how much power will you need in the future if everything does go electric and it's really really difficult to to know um, so you have to just be clever in terms of renewable energy what you can do with solar uh, potentially what you can do with batteries is, as Ian mentioned but I think the um, your traditional warehouse sort of out of town um, is unlikely to change significantly but I think as you get closer to the urban centres um, if, if, if there's no more deliveries by lorries and it's much smaller trucks then it's much easier to go multi-storey uh, but when is that going to change? And you're very, very brave to build a multi-storey today with a ramp for large trucks if you find out in three or four years you don't need it because it's extremely expensive. So I, I think we will see the closer you get to urban areas, um, different types of product um, being worked on and investigated, but maybe not necessarily developed today, uh, just because the future there is so uncertain in terms of how goods are going to be transported. Um, so I think that's a really interesting one to watch. Um, and do you, I mean, Sally, this is just coming to you. I don't know whether there's because obviously there's there's a lot of that multi-level, multi-story um, type of, of product, type of real estate in Asia. Um, is that an opportunity here in 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 Europe as well? Do you think is that the way it'll go, or or are there issues as as Ben mentioned there, in, just in terms of the costs of putting that in place? I think um, th there are certainly challenges around it on a cost basis and also understanding how users will use the space, you know, as, as Ben said, and as, as actually we've been thinking about recently, uh, Kushma Wakefield, about what that means, learning stories from our Asian colleagues in particular and trying to understand the ways in which multi-story warehouses have been utilised in Asia, but also understanding that the story is different for for Europe um, and what it will how the product will be translatable into environments, particularly where there is a pressure on the availability of sites. And as well, we all know that, that there is a high competition, not just from logistics for those small, those infill sites in urban areas, but from other competing uses, which is driving cost. I think ultimately it will come down to the way in which operators will use the space. And 
the locations are incredibly important because being in the right location, sorry, being in the wrong location is far more costly than paying a higher rent or a higher operational cost for the overall facility in the right location. I'm sure Raymond will, you know, be able to attest for or, or, or debate. But I think, you know, broadly speaking, from our research, there is a greater, a higher cost of not being in the right location. How to get the most out of those sites will start to focus the minds of the operators and what they can use their space for. And so I think it will be largely driven by the operational market, the occupier. You know, I, I, I try to say operational or user because we, we sort of, you know, the, build, the, the people who use us, the space in our market are the ones who are governing so much about how we then respond to build the physical infrastructure that they get to do their operations within. And I think that's the thing that will drive. That I think until there is a real pressure to be in those locations specifically where we need to intensify that use, um, that it will become, uh, it will be a slightly more challenging um, so solution to build multi-level. That's not to say that it won't start to happen. And we're certainly starting to see steps into that, into multi-level in Europe, not least from, from Prologis or GLP or, you know, being able to bring that kind of product, but it will ultimately come down to how well it's operate, how well it's able to be operated and the location of those sites, I think. Yeah. I think I, I, you're actually... Sorry, we're seeing significant, I mean, such significant rental growth. London's probably the best example, London or Paris. But the rental growth is so significant that you can still pay top dollar for these sites and develop standard product and make the numbers pencil without having to go multi-storey. And our customers don't want to go multi-storey. They will only go multi-storey if there's no you know, alternative. So uh, as long as we're seeing the rental growth we're seeing, and I, I don't know where the limit is to that in somewhere like London, uh, we keep pushing it and it's still going north. So it's going to be really interesting to see at what point there's a sort of inflection that it no longer works for our customers. Uh, Otis, you wanted to pick that up, yeah. Yeah, just a quick question for Sally. In terms of your research, are you seeing any uh, trend in the direction of mixed use, where we there was talk before of sheds and beds, but is that just talk, or do you actually see more projects where there are a mixing of uses to satisfy the local demands? Um, it's, it's still relatively early days, I'd suggest. Uh, there are relatively few schemes that are offering a true mixed usage. I think that uh, we're starting to see some shifting dynamics around um, not not so much resi, but certainly there have been some um, recent transactions like, you know, Seagro uh, have got their first shed uh, let. I, stop, I must stop calling it sheds. Their first facility, because it, it, apparently it's diminishing to our sector, which isn't very fair. Um, but but it's, uh, um, they have certainly done their first transaction on their scheme in West London, which is a co-located with residential scheme. Um, I think it will, it will be probably site specific um, and it will, but it, on, as a, as a sort of, a, a, as an aside, we are starting to see sort of the sharpening of minds around the usage of um, other property types within the flow of products. So thinking as a, re you know, for retailers in particular, who have over the last year had this huge shift in dynamic in their businesses, you know, we've had online for a little while, obviously it's had made a huge difference to our sector, but it's also having a really big influence on the retail sector. Now, now, with this huge change over the past 12 to 15 months, we now have retailers starting to sharpen their minds. Okay, we now have all these new customers. How do we serve them? If we started from scratch, we might start by planning out these fantastic logistics operations within warehouses, but we have a whole lot of stores. So how do we utilize our store base to be able to maximize both our um, the utilization of our portfolios? We've got stores close to customers who need proper servicing to maintain customer satisfaction. So there is perhaps a rethinking around how can we utilize our stores and not necessarily a true conversion of space, but perhaps thinking about how can we utilize the store networks to be able to deliver from store 
So fulfillment from store and perhaps stores um, have some natural advantages in singles picking versus, you know, bulk picking or, you know, that that kind of so different types of product, different types of retail product. We may see some not conversion, but some more sort of supply chain utilization. It's all about the flow of product, isn't it? And being able to get the product to the customer in their hands at the time that they want it and, and maintain that customer satisfaction to maintain business. So yeah, I, I, I think it's a difficult question to answer, but I think probably there are some moving plates in this. There are some moving tectonic plates in this. Totally agree on the retail side. That's one of our areas is looking at retail logistics because there's this blurring of the lines of the uses and retailers being one of the big occupiers and users, utilizers of our space to see how this interplay is going to work out in the future with click and collect, et cetera. So that whole yeah. shopping experience is going to be changing. Okay. And do you, just picking up on that point, Otis, um, do you see that being that there will be kind of yeah, – a model where you've got a shop front, but the you know the back of it is logistics, and people are doing mainly click and collect from it. That kind of perhaps yes, because it's it's all about that location, that getting as close as you can to those consumers, and so better utilizing that space where you have the sh the, the showroom in front, and then the warehouse distribution facility in the back. That that could be part of the future. Um, I just wanted to pick up a couple of things. I'm going to come to you in a second, uh, Raymond, and, and you in as well. Um, just got a just got a question in, um, and also welcome Juan Luis um, from Miami. If there's anybody joining us from further afield than uh, than Miami, put yourselves in the chat. Um, also, if you do ask a question, remember that uh, uh, it, you can like it as well, and then it will. Uh, I will automatically answer it in any event. Um, but let's pick up on this from uh, Stefan Sigmund. Thanks, Stefan, for for joining us and for asking this question, which is according to our projects, um, railway connection to logistics real estate facilities seems to be fundamental in CE. Um, are you focusing on it? What can be done better here? Um, so I don't know whether anybody wants to pick up that point, which I suppose is around the connectivity, but also, I mean, interestingly, maybe around Sally's point um, uh, around the carbon footprint, uh, maybe more focus on, on rail. I don't know, what, what's anybody's view on that? So Richard, when we first went into Poland, um, oh God, I can't even remember, nine, 95, whatever, a, a long time ago, uh, we had a big focus on rail served sites because we did believe that would be the future, particularly because the, the road infrastructure was, was so poor. Uh, obviously the road infrastructure there is now one of the best in Europe, to be honest, in terms of quality. Uh, so it's a different issue. But um, I don't think one of those facilities that we've built uses rail. I think there, there might be one out of, say, five or six that we developed where the rail is actually being used. We are seeing in the UK uh, uh, increase in, in demand uh, for rail service um, properties or at least uh, buildings located close to a rail terminal if they're not actually served directly by rail. But uh, Robert, I mean, you're developing a lot in Central Europe. Maybe you've seen something different. No, I, I actually agree. Probably kind of a two or three facilities in the process. So it's not a big thing to say. Not a big thing for you. Okay, that's interesting. Um, Ian, I, I just wanted to pick up with you, um, just in terms of, I suppose, the, 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 that point around location, mixed use, um, from both from an occupier and, and I suppose, investor perspective, um, how can you, I, I guess, operate within that urban area is does urban really mean urban last mile or are you going to be further out of town will electrification of vehicles make a difference to how far the real estate can be in an urban setting um, i suppose what are the things you're having to think about in terms of the future of those real estate assets I, a lot depends on city to city because planning is going to be very different. You know, the city of London, yeah, you know, there's already uh, there was a white I think it was a white paper came out, a green paper came out, suggesting that um, any last mile distributions should be outside the M25 because at the moment the whole of the city of London is clogged up with delivery vans. So the idea is let's let's put them all outside and then deliver from there, which is probably beyond the the, the realms of uh, electric robots at the moment. So um, I think it's I think it's coming in the future. 
I don't think it's there now. Um, if you look at somewhere like the, you know, I mean, Ben and Raymond both know the Netherlands very well, and I think there you look at some of the places that have been taken for last mile logistics are very interesting. They're old, old warehouses repurposed from the sort of turn of the century or the last century. Um, so I think that um, it is something we have to look at, and um, as we go forward, it will definitely be be more important. Um, and uh, I wanted to pick up on uh, a point with you, Raymond, just in terms of the, I mean, how important do you think well-being and those kinds of things? There's been a lot of focus on wellness, sustainability, ESG, well-being. How important is that going to be in terms of, you know, when you're looking at, uh, I suppose, the real estate for you? Are you looking at price? Are you looking at location? Are you looking at access to people, the well-being of those people? W what areas are you looking at? Of course, who knows? We knows that we want everything, you know, for the, the lowest price, the best quality, and everything. No <laughs> kidding. But maybe before I go to the well-being, I just wanted to add something on this location part because I think it's very. This uh, multi-story is a topic, you know. I'm interested since a long time. So first of all, I think multi-story is definitely the the way to go for single usage. I think that if you know, Amazon is doing it, we will do it, or we're doing it already. And one thing is always that if you come to the RAMs, you know, we always compare with. We do not compare apples to apples because if you look into the Asian cities, they're all 30 mi million people. You know, Tokyo, I think the metropolitan area, 30 million. Shanghai, so I think the top 15 countries, uh, you know, the, the cities with the, with the most inhabitants is, you know, the, I think the lowest is 30 million. And then London, I think it's somewhere 30, place 30 with uh, 12 million, if I'm correct. So maybe London could be the first one where, where, where it's coming. Uh, but that's just a side remark. I, I do not believe that Europe is big enough for, for, for this kind of ramp facilities because you have to be close to the customer. If you talk about beds and sheds or, you know, going closer to the city, I think you always have to distinguish what you're talking about it. And uh, Sally did it already. And Ian, by the way, I, I really like it how much the industry has learned you know in the 20 years ago nobody knew about bike picking or single picking yeah. or uh, you know last mile or middle mile so everyone knows it now very customer focused compliments so and uh, but however if you have this last mile facilities or middle mile facilities which have to be close to the customer so there you will have this bed in sheds but then you're talking about maximum 10,000 square meters or 100,000 square foot in the, in the UK but that's the max rather <coughs> 1,000 square meters uh, okay, and now of course sustainability and well-being is very important. It goes actually hand in hand because if you if you really look into it, and I think that's one of the biggest challenge for the for the industry right now, is the embodied carbon. What Sally mentioned, you know, that's that means we have to think about a complete new way of constructing buildings. And we all know, being in the business, that all the contractors out there, you know, they, they are somehow bound to steel or bound to concrete. Uh, so it's a very disruptive business and you do not find any specialists really rethinking it. And it will take some time to to find new materials and rebuild it, but it's a big challenge. But of course, assuming a, a warehouse in wood has also a quality for the well-being. I think it is important that you offer, you know, good uh, rest areas, terraces, or maybe even that people can go out and walking through some green areas where you have both again sustainability and green parts. So there's some buildings, they have already little jungles or woods out there. Um, so that's definitely something what is coming and we're looking for. So we're still trying to find the balance that you don't get us wrong. Uh, so we are not trying now to, to get everything uh, and pay a super extra price for it, but we know that we have to pay a price, you know, to, to get the quality and also uh, you know, for the competition, for the, the you know, also to get the best labor into the building. Um, and it'd be interesting to know. I mean, there's there's been the, there's been a discussion when I've been doing these over the past however many years it is, 10, 12 years. Um, with a view that maybe some of the some of the situation in terms of there being a lack of uh, a lack of employees, difficulty from that side would be replaced by automation. Um, so I just wanted to look at some of those the automation things that we're looking at that might influence it, whether that's robotics inside, whether that's drones, whether it's automatic, you know, aut automatic vehicles. Um, what do we actually expect to see? 
um, and you know, do, you know, what's actually going to influence the real estate as opposed to just being a bit of interest, really. Um, you know, so is is if drones come in, does that affect the real estate in a major way, or is actually more, you know, uh, automatic driving is going to, you know, driverless trucks is going to change it most. What well, what's going to have the biggest effect out of those technology sides? That's for anybody, really. I think I think uh, drones around Heathrow sounds like an interesting mix. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so I think they're going to have to be very careful on the laws of, of, of drones flying around, although I can see it, it is the future. But I think I, I seem to remember reading an Amazon um, uh, uh, a quote that about 20 or 25 percent of their staff are robots. Um, the cable robots that they have in their facilities, but they, that, that those have really replaced people. And I think that's what's going to happen in the future. And um, uh, you know, the more you look at um, ESG, maybe the requirements from planners, etc. well, robots don't need any of those. Um, Raymond's, Raymond's garden probably will be attended by robots, but a lot of his staff will be. So I think for the future, we've, we've got a plan for it, but it's very hard to know which robots, what they're going to be like, what power they need. But the, the, the thing is really, uh, you know, of course, it's a topic and I've seen it, you know, in the 23 years working for e-commerce cutting edge companies. So I remember the early discussions about automation, almost nothing was possible. And if you look now, what is somehow possible, uh, there's a lot. And but, you know, if you are, first of all, I do not think I cannot imagine a warehouse without people because it's still difficult and people are still scalable. It sounds terrible, but you know it's much easier to to hire more people rather than industry. But there will be some work what actually also people don't like to do. Um, there will be robots, but if you ask me about the impact of real estate, I even do not see it too big because what what, what you're talking about more is this cobots thing that you have actually robots and people working hand in hand. So that means they're also maneuvering on the floor. So it's it's not this kind of sites what you have seen somewhere 20 years ago, huge automation with conveyor belts and drop and the KUKA robots, you know, they're just doing some things or building you cannot use for anything else. I guess in most of the existing buildings you could build some kind of uh, robots, but they have to come. By the way, also something that we always forget that also population is decreasing in Europe. Um, so it will be also harder and harder to find people to work in the buildings. That's also an element that's not coming into the play in the next five years, but in 10 years, it's definitely something we're talking about. But I mean, regardless of automation, we've got more people working in our portfolio than ever. And I don't just mean by, you know, one times is significantly more. Uh, so in terms of wellness, um, you know, our, our customer feedback for the last two years has been uh, labor is their biggest concern. Number one concern. Actually, real estate is slowly creeping up there, but labor is by far the number one. Um, and you need to be able to attract labor and then you need to be able to retain it. And if you used to have 10 people working in a warehouse, well, I mean, you just you find a way. But when you've got two and a half, three thousand people, you need to provide proper facilities. Uh, they need fresh air. You know, they need natural daylight. They need health. So I think. Uh, it's a massive part of our um, business, particularly if you're developing parks and you're close to a community. Uh, not only are you having to provide facilities for the employees, but also for the surrounding uh, community as well. So we have an uh, initiative, Park Life, which is, is really just focused on this. Um, so really, how do our customers attract labor to these locations and then how do they retain it once they're there? I can I can only echo, and you made a very important point that it, you know you're talking most of the eco, of course e-commerce is not everything, but in, in in many of the big boxes, you're talking about two to five thousand people in the building. So even if you would have an automation of replacing fifty percent, it's still a lot of people. So I, I'm not thinking it's coming, but it's again dimension. So it's not changing everything. Uh, and labor is definitely the biggest topic for us. So if you go on a site search, it's always the first topic. It's not working because of labor. So, I, I, I meant to say in in I, I didn't mention it, but it, it's um, that the automation um, story obviously is one that's been continuing for a while, and that you know the, the the type and the cost of automation has has really quite has changed quite dramatically. And um, but only certain activities of a job can be automated. You know, human labour and, and human capital is there to be complemented by the the tech. That really, you know, we we used to talk about four 
the four Ds in automation. So the four Ds that, that automation would help to alleviate the dull, the dangerous, the dirty and the difficult. And there are now perhaps two more. One is delicate. And uh, although somebody did say this is a bit an old fashioned term, dear. So, you know, where things are expensive, where, where it's expensive to have, uh, you, you can't not have people in the warehouse, but as the cost of labor is going up and the supply may be more constrained, being able to use the automation to be able to complement the productivity of, of the people working in the warehouses. So it's not replacing, it's complementing. And I think, you know, that's where, and, and the, the flexibility of the automation, you know, when I say automation, it kind of encompasses lots of different things, but it could be things like augmented reality goggles, being able to guide a, uh, a, a worker to the right place on the shelf to be able to pick the product. So something as straightforward and as simple and as flexible that can be adopted to a wide range of different uses. So it's not, it's not the sort of, like Raymond said, the 20 years ago image of a robot doing a single job over and over and over again. It's the flexibility and adaptability and the broader range of operations that can now be complementing the human labor, the human capital, the, the people who are doing the job with the tech. Yeah. Well, Richard, all I would add to that point is that's what we are looking at ourselves when we develop or when we're acquiring an asset is just not the investment or in that development, but also what's happening within the space itself. So as an investor, we're willing to provide financing for this automation, whether it's, um, you know, it's hardware investments within that space or other uh, types of automation as P3. That's one of the areas that we look at. If it's an investment grade customer, then we're willing there to really uh, invest and finance those improvements. Great. Thanks, Agnes. Um, I've got a couple of questions that have come in. Um, one is from uh, Jan. Um, thanks very much for, for that, Jan, which is um, we're discussing warehouses at the moment, but what about hubs and depots? Um, which challenges do you see there? And also Juan Luis from uh, from Miami has, has, has just said that um, in terms of logistics infrastructure, Miami area is growing and growing. Um, but just really wanted to wanted to pick up um, that it seems to be not big enough yet <laughs> um, and that demand just continually grows um, and wanting to know what the situation is in in Europe so I don't know whether anybody wants to pick up those two points either about whether or not the increased demand in cities is just exponentially increasing the demand for logistics and the, and the issue is to catch up I guess um, and and also what about hubs and depots I think populations are moving back to cities, and while that happens, um, you know, you've got the you, things are going to grow, and demand's going to grow. I mean, I think the effect of COVID and has that moved the office market outside of um, outside of the city? Um, my daughter happens to be an office agent at Cushman and Wakefield, and she was telling me they've seen quite a quite an uh, uplift in people looking to relocate out of the cities, just because um, people are concerned about a co another COVID in the future. Um, um, so I don't know if that's right or not, but that may affect how um, distribution goes. So we, again, another thing we have to look at. I think we've been sort of considering this recently about, you know, when we talk about, and I, I deliberately um, call it last link logistics. We, we, uh, uh, we, we call it last link logistics because it doesn't just relate to the urban story. You know, and we talk about things like, you know, drop density and uh, operational efficiency and margin accretive because all of these things are driving the choices particularly that you know retailers in particular but not just the retailers but you know, any logistics operator particularly in last mile or last link I should say last kilometer as well to be embracing um, but it's the idea that we have such a, a vast array of different ways in which product needs to be got to final destination now. It's no longer, you know, port of entry, DC, shop, and then the consumer comes and gets it. There are so many different variations that it's trying to find the, the ways in which that can be operationally efficient. Um, I do think that the urbanization story continues. It, it, it has changed complexion slightly in the past year with the conversation around how people choose to live and work. Um, but I think that's probably a, there are lots of different stories around that, but I think that probably we will still, still see the continuation of the urbanization story. 
category. It, it's not one that is looking like it's reversing. There may be some more suburban stories around that, though, which will be an interesting dynamic in how it's served. Um, but some interesting opportunities in that as well, particularly around what it means for um, the, the dynamism of local and urban centres, but also how we serve customers and where they're going to be at any given time. You know, we haven't seen a huge um, uptick. We haven't seen a huge sort of uptake over the past 20 years in, say, the UK of lockers but we and, and parcel shops. But then on the continent, they're extremely popular. So, you know, it might just be a rebalancing in the way in which um, product has got to different locations. It won't mean a diminishing in the number of places that need to be served. In fact, it could mean more, <laughs> which is more challenge, more opportunity. And by the way, we should, we, we, should, we should not forget that there is, you know, there's has always been distribution into the city. Sometimes we speak about it like the, the the inventory came magically into the city. You know, all the shops they have to be delivered, and also there are also returns because not everything is sold. So the, the only difference is that you see the delivery when all the other ones you usually don't see because they come in the morning. So th there will be some ways of consolidation. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Um, I've got a last question. There's there's a couple of ones that I'll I'll try and pick up within this, um, but I wanted to just get what the biggest changes you think we'll see by the time of the next transport and logistics, um, which is obviously every two years. So that'll be in 2023. Um, what are the key changes that we're expecting to see? So you've each got kind of 20 seconds on that, um, and if it's possible, particularly those. There's a couple of questions that came in. One from Tom. Um, and uh, one from Premislav here, which is um, rental dynamics between CEE and Western Europe, and and also which CE markets would you consider the most attractive in the near future for logistics investments? Um, so feel free to pick up any of those in the remaining sort of one two minutes we've got left. Um, let's start with you, Otis. Biggest changes. Biggest change, I think we will still see this to be a very dynamic asset class. And in terms of where yields are going, I think we're going to see further of a shrinking of the gap between office yields and logistics. And so I'm just looking forward to a very dynamic and bright future for logistics. OK, super. Um, Robert, what about you? Yeah, I, I, would, I would agree that uh, and the, the, the immediate future is obviously uh, amazing for the asset class. I mean, probably what we would uh, get used to slower. I mean, we will obviously stop. We'll quickly forget about COVID. I think it's it's uh, it's. I think it's going to go away soon as a topic. And uh, I think people would come back to normality quite quite fast. And resilience of supply chains would go away. People would be chasing costs again and proximity and uh, that, that's gonna that's gonna be happening but clearly for a, for a kind of a near future we would have land construction costs resources under huge pressure and that's and the, obviously occupiers will be pressing and we would try to serve them and there'll be a lot of uh, resource constrained market next year I and mean, for the for the next 12 months that's for sure so, which is which is exciting, obviously. Okay. Okay. Great, Ian. Um, I think we're going to see um, continued uh, demand for um, from e-commerce. I think we're going to need to see warehouses that become almost power production uh, units. I can see a point in the next few years where maybe different occupiers can swap power or sell power to each other, rather than at the moment selling power to the grid and then buying it back from the grid. So I think that's going to be an interesting change. Um, but I think um, I agree with Raymond, the future's, the future's bright, the future's warehouse. Great, thanks very much. Sally? Uh, very short and sharp. I think it's going to be just the breadth of demand, the all, so many different sources for so many different types of product. And then the challenge will be the supply side, finding sites, building them and being able to deliver to the market in the huge quantities and the speed with which it's demanding it. Super, thank you. Raymond? 
And I think, you know, you're talking about transport and logistic fares and then talking about more an industry trend. I would guess that in two years we can talk more about new transportation ways because I think we, it's getting more mature. And I think in the hockey stick, we're getting a little bit now in the upside curve that there's maybe more tangible what is going to happen with electric trucks or autonomous trucks, not in two years, but the discussion will maybe change in this direction. How can we do it? And also last mile deliveries, what impact would it have on the being electrified? So that's probably the, the, the first time that we will speak more about it in more details. Okay, great. Thank you. And last but not least, Ben. I think continued focus and even more so on ESG. I just think that's going to get, um, you know, a real bigger focus in the coming couple of years. I, I think we're going to see rental growth that none of us expect. I mean, significant rental growth. Uh, replacement costs are spiking. Uh, land prices are you know, doubling in certain markets in the last 12 months, that's not going to stop. And that's going to feed through to, to higher rents. And rents are 5% of the equation. So, you know, if something's going to go up, it will be it will be rent. So let's see. I know, Raymond, that's not what you want to hear, but um, we'll see where that goes, particularly in urban locations. And as a result of continued cap rate compression and rental growth, we're going to see capital values that we never thought possible in industrial. Great. Really interesting. Um, thanks very much for sharing all of your views. Thanks for the presentation, Sally. Um, the presentation is available certainly on our website, and we'll try to make it available on the Transport and Logistics website as well. Um, but you can certainly access it um, if you would like that. Just let us know. Thank you for all of your questions. Um, really interesting discussion. And uh, hopefully the biggest change that we will have is that um, in two years time, we will be able to meet up in person in Munich at Transport and Logistics in 2023. Thanks very much for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. Guys. Thank you. Bye.